This is OTR-FM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome. There's an old saying that you can't judge a book by its cover. And since our very first episode, I've discovered that you can't always gauge the kinds of books that inspire people's life's paths from their resumes. Such is certainly true of this week's guest, Rebecca Rowland, who is a nationally certified speech language pathologist, an oral and written language specialist in the neurology department of Children's Hospital Boston, and a Harvard le lecturer, a mother of two who works with parents, educators and clinicians to build thriving families, classrooms and relationships. Rebecca Rowland is also the author of The Art of Talking with Children, which details rich talk, 
and listening to cultivate children's creativity, kindness and curiosity. Rebecca Rowland, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Rebecca, words and language are such a natural part of our lives that most of us rarely stop to consider how critical they are to the experience of our life. Yet for you, words and language not only underpin your entire career, but also led you to a deep understanding and value of their power to express thoughts and feelings. So where did that start for you? Yes, it's actually been sort of a lifelong path for me and kind of a winding path that started really with a love of poetry. So even as a young student, I enjoyed English poetry, French and German poetry, and just really enjoyed hearing language, hearing poems read aloud. And as I grew up, I began to kind of hear what I call sort of the poetry of everyday life. Uh, so people actually speaking and hearing how poetic dialogue can be and how it really does underpin so many of our relationships and what our children's relationships turn out to be like. Is that one of the reasons why you chose the career that you did? Because you wanted to help people who was, you know, having issues with language and words? Definitely, yeah. So I really just so how profound it is to be able to communicate sort of what a gift it is and then also how challenging at a, even a spiritual level and a psychological level it can be to not be able to do so. Uh, I just met so many people in the course of my career who had strokes, who had traumatic brain injuries, who just were unable to come out with words anymore. And to see the way they were impacted and their families were impacted, it felt so much like a shift in their identities. And that, to me, really moved me to try to do something. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's something that never occurred to me until I was reading um, what you've said about words and language and thinking about how challenging it would be to communicate if, you know, if you didn't have access to, to words, to being, being able to speak. But also, you know, one of the things I love about books is that I like to talk to people about the books. Yes. And if you can't share you know, something that you've read, the words and language that you've read, that's really hard. Yes, and especially it's been so fascinating. I've worked with a lot of people with aphasia, so which is a word finding disorder, meaning that you have the ideas, you have the thoughts, but you can't come out with the words. Yes. And so to feel almost locked in in that way, where, you know, you want to be able to say things and you can't, uh, is just profoundly uh, difficult for these people. So what kinds of books, you've talked about your love of poetry, and clearly, you, you know, when you're reading a book, you're looking for things that maybe some other people aren't, things that, you know, in, just incite pleasure in you. Um, your list was quite a surprise to me, <laughs> you know, because I thought, wow, I didn't expect these books at all. I was <laughs> expecting something a little bit more academic, perhaps. Um, <laughs> you know, something that where you've studied so much as well. Um, but let's talk about your books. And um, the first one you say was very important in informing the ways you think about writing and the nature of experience. And it is The Waves by Virginia Woolf. What did you find so interesting about that book? Yes, I really found that Woolf, especially in that book, is able to get into the hearts and minds and consciousness of people, even through the ways that the language is constructed. So you really feel, at least I feel when reading that book, as if I'm thinking the thoughts of another person in the way he or she would think them. And to me, that is just such an amazing ability to be able to almost leap out of your own self into another person's self through reading uh, in sort of a more profound way than I've done typically in books. And I think she has such a way of, especially sort of the stream of consciousness writing, where it feels as though kind of the way you can think of your thoughts is jumping from here to there is yeah. mirrored in that writing. Uh, so it doesn't flow in the way as traditional books would. And that to me was, is fascinating and continues to fascinate me, how we can mirror thoughts in language. Did you not feel, I mean, when you read that, did you not feel a bit irritated because it's one thing you know to to hear somebody speaking and you know or yourself your thoughts mm -hmm. you know the the trail that they take but to actually read that often can be a different experience when somebody's jumping all, all over the place 
For sure. I mean, I think I would say I definitely have to be in a certain mindset to read it. I need to be able to sort of sit and be relaxed enough to be absorbed into that experience. So it can't be done in a rush. And I think if I am rushed and wanting kind of a quick result, I won't read something like that. But I think in the right mindset, it is this experience almost of empathy in a way that you really are able to inhabit someone else. So it's challenging, but I think it's pleasurable in its own way. Do you ever give um, any uh, of your clients books to read that you think Mm -hmm. might help them with their own Mm -hmm. um, use of language? Yes, sometimes I do. And it really, a lot of times, actually, especially with kids and even with adults, it has to do with fairy tales, interestingly. Um, Because I find that fairy tales really do have so many themes um, that are so sort of universal and can draw on so many different experiences. And that also we can identify with many different people in fairy tales in different ways. So I often like to use that both to take other perspectives, but even to support expression to think about, well, who do you feel like in this story? Yeah, it's also, um, you know, the metaphors that, that, that go exactly. in at a subconscious <laughs> level yes, as well. Yes, yes, yeah. for sure. Mm. All the archetypes, yes. Yes, absolutely. So your second book was The Dream All Elegies and the Sonnets to Orpheus uh, by Raina Maria Rilke, uh, published in 1923. <laughs> Yes. Um, and that book to me is comes out of my love actually of German poetry. So I spent a lot of years studying German. And then when I was in college, took a class on um, German poetry and performance. And that to me was just so interesting because it was my first experience actually needing to memorize poems and recite them in a foreign language. Um, and in that way, I still, all these years later, have ringing in my head some of those poems, because you almost do have to inhabit them to be able to memorize them, to be able to recite them convincingly. Um, And Rilke's book and his work in general is one of the ones I come back to the most, um, because it is so internal, it is so searching, um, and it's sort of driving towards that abstraction, sort of who will hear us, really the sense of um, wanting to be heard by the universe. And I think it's such a human longing. And um, and I just find it beautiful, both in German and even in translation. And it's also a longing that anyone who does have trouble speaking shares. Exactly. Yes, that's actually, that's a great point. I hadn't made that connection. But yes, who will hear us if you, you know, are not able to communicate. So yeah. still that same drive to communicate, for sure. What attracted you to the German language? Because it is a hard mm-hmm. language to learn. Yes, yes. I mean, I find that... Um, there's definitely a really interesting grammar to it, I find. Um, I now speak French probably better than I speak German because of my, my husband is French. Um, but uh, I, I still come back to that, to the ways the grammar kind of accumulates, um, the ways you can put pieces together to make longer words, um, which I just really find fun um, and doesn't work obviously the same way as English. So you can have these long words which are built of many chunks. Um, and, and I do find that just the way that it sounds almost feels, sounds very musical to me. So, um, uh, there is a harshness to it, but I would say also a musicality. So when you're reading something in German, are you mentally translating it into English to fully mm-hmm. comprehend? No, I don't. No, I think, um, I may perhaps now as my German is not as good as it once was, I may struggle over words more, but no, I really do hear it, um, sort of just as it is. And same, even now when I hear people speaking German, I immediately can understand it many years after studying it. So, um, and it is more of just sort of being immersed in that. I I actually spent some, a while studying in Germany. And so I think that did help me feel sort of more fully immersed in the language. I'm curious to know that if you say read a poem in German and then you read the same poem in English, whether there would be any kind of difference anywhere or you'd notice something that you hadn't noticed in the other language? Yes, I, I often do. And I do have a lot of bilingual editions because I buy them, you know, in the, in the States where it's hard to find just purely German editions of things. Um, and I find that actually a lot of the music, I often am disappointed, unfortunately, when I read translations, um, because I find that no matter how much the meaning gets communicated, something is lost um, in terms of the way there's even off rhymes, the way the, the beats are working. And I think as poets, or we think so much about both the structure of a line, but even just the structure of the beats, the sort of the stresses. And so it's obviously can't be the same 
Um, but at the same time, sometimes I do find new ideas and new thoughts in the translation that I hadn't considered sort of in the way the translation works. So I wouldn't say it's always a negative experience, but it's, so, it's mixed. <laughs> yeah, so in that interpretation, something mm -hmm. gets revealed. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah, very interesting. Your third book, Inner Engineering, A Yogi's Guide to Joy by a Sadguru, that was published in 2016. Yes, and I find that book, I, I continue to go back to it because I find it actually oddly practical, even though it, it does sort of have a lot of stories of gurus and of, uh, you know, historical, you know, anecdotes and so on. But I find that to really think about how we can move meditation into all aspects of our lives in practical ways, it is really useful. So he has several strategies, like to really notice as you're going to sleep, sort of the juncture between waking and sleep. And as you wake up, similarly to sort of sit and notice the juncture between sleep and waking as sort of a meditation in itself. Um, so he has these sort of practices, which are, I find somewhat unique and really do spur attention to sort of the moment and mindfulness uh, in a way that I find isn't always done. So I really appreciate that. And I recommend it to people. When you were compiling your list, was it difficult? It was, it was actually very difficult. <laughs> Because I think I started actually with more academic books um, was my sort of my first draft. And then I thought, well, these are interesting to me intellectually, for sure. But um, I sort of thought, well, which ones really guided my journey and which ones do I continue to turn to? And that's kind of where I, I came to the second layer, um, which were actually much broader in range. Do you find um, that uh, that's a criteria for you, you know, for loving a book um, is how often you return to it? Yes, I think to some extent. So I think uh, sort of how often, but then also in what moments. So sometimes uh, if it's think I'm thinking I really can't can figure out how to move forward with something or I really feel stuck, you know, and if I if I know that book is there, oh, I can return to that book and I find this nourishing. I think that's also uh, also something. Mm. They're all quite different, your books. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I would say I, uh, <laughs> I'm definitely a lifelong learner. I love to read in such a, a really wide range of genres and even to challenge myself with things I don't know at all. So um, I'm always approaching books with a beginner's mind, I would say. <laughs> mm. Well, your fourth book, according to American existential psychologist and author Rollo May, um, goes beyond the usual theories of mental illness and alienation and makes a convincing case for the madness of morality. And the book is The Politics of Experience by R.D. Lang. So yes. tell us about this book. Yes, I think this book is quite unusual, um, I would say. It, it went beyond um, the sort of typical thinking of the time, and I would say it goes beyond the typical thinking even now. And what's so profound about it, I think, is it makes the case that oftentimes we don't consider how odd and how constrained our society is when considering people's behavior, their emotions, their spiritual expressions. And we often try to put labels on people, on experiences, without realizing how limited our society has become in terms of you know, how much we allow within the range of normality. So um, I really appreciate that because it considers that a lot of our society needs to be looked at. So how much do we allow people to express themselves creatively? How much do we allow for dancing or singing or sort of, you know, outward expressions of joy? Um, all of these things, how much do we allow for rituals? Um, and I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of benefit in actually to expanding our notion of what's human. And that's what I love about that book. Well, and a lot of it is historic, isn't it? Because, I yeah. mean, we, we probably um, look more askance at people suddenly breaking into song in the middle of a street or dancing around a maypole today <laughs> exactly. than we might have done a few hundred years ago. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's also another point is he really emphasizes looking always at the context that people don't exist in vacuums, but they're actually responding to something in their, in their societies. Yeah, yeah, or in their inner experience. Exactly. Yes. You know, and that's something that we are discouraged from expressing <laughs> yes. as well. Exactly. Yeah. We look back hundreds of years and there were these, you know, dance plagues and things where people started dancing and could not stop. And, you know, there are yeah. all of these really interesting occurrences. And I think in our society, yes, we would definitely turn a, 
<laughs> negative eye towards a lot of that. Well, with so so much focus on mental health, so many people suffering right now. This is something that maybe you know people should look at a bit more closely because our definitions are very narrow. Exactly, and I think also we don't allow for much exploration. So there is this sense of lots of experience happening through technology and children yeah. experiencing the world through their phones. And you know, it's sort of like, well, what? How much can we expand on? what's normal or typical as experience. So yeah. I definitely agree. Yeah. Do you find <clears throat> any books on this list that have really informed or given you inspiration in your work, the way that you are communicating mm -hmm. with people or helping them to communicate? Yes, I think um, several of them. So one actually, um, recently I really enjoyed a, the Black Hole Survival Guide. <laughs> so I have a, a real love for astrophysics and I'm sort of study this a lot on sort of an amateur level. And I really appreciate that because it actually does try to take you into what the experience would be like of being near a black hole and how you might not survive it. Um, and what I appreciate that is that it really uses all of the senses. So it actually takes you into what it would look like, how you would feel, what this, you know, the sounds would be like. And I think that in my own work in teaching people to communicate, I really do support them in sort of how do we paint these pictures for a reader? How do you actually bring them to that experience rather than just having it be intellectualized? And I think her work especially is something where she takes an extremely abstract and hard to understand topic and makes it into a really sensory experience, which is very cool. Well, she sounds like a really interesting lady. I've never come across mm -hmm. her before, but she's also written... Um, Black Hole Blues yes. and mm -hmm. other songs from outer space, which is yes. you know, a pretty quirky title. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And I actually just finished that. And that's actually, it's interesting. It's a much more historical book about um, how these sort of scientists created an observatory and so on. But um, it is sort of more, more traditional in its, in its writing, but has a similar theme. Um, what is, you mentioned in your write-up that she talks about why black holes have no hair. <laughs> Which seems an interesting thing. I mean, why would would they? Why would they? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. I, I think yes. It's clearly just a metaphor, but I think that's what I kind of like about this book is it has a sense of humor. And the idea is that black holes cannot retain any characteristics for long because they always are exactly identical, depending on you know their mass or other factors. And so, um, so the idea that black holes have no hair means that really they are not unique looking or not, you know, don't have unique characteristics. And what I think is great is that kind of use of metaphor. You could easily just make that a scientific abstract point. But uh, when we hear that, you immediately think, you know, well, why should they have hair? <laughs> you know, And so I think that's a really funny and uh, intriguing way to put it. What was the most fascinating thing that you learned from that book? <sighs> oh, that's a good question. I would say um, the fact that... Um, sort of the event horizon. She talks about sort of nearing a black hole and, um, and how you might not know, you know, that you're going, you're just about to get to the edge of it. So, so sort of the fact that, um, you know, you get closer and closer and yet uh, you're not aware of the, what's about to happen to you. <laughs> and I think that to me is just, is really interesting to realize sort of how would this feel? How would it not necessarily feel terrible until you were, you know, at the end basically. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because she's never experienced a black yes. hole. Yes, she's I studied so. them exactly. So, so I think it's imagining. Them. Yeah, so it's imagining kind of what would it what would it be like if you were in this experience from what we know now. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. very curious. Uh, book number six, the God Equation: The Quest for a Theory of Everything by Michio Kaku, and that was yes. published just uh, last year. Yes, yes. So yes, definitely. He is a great writer, I think. And for all of these really big questions, I found his books just fascinating because he thinks about really big topics that, you know, takes on questions of the future. Um, you know, what is the future going to look like? And this um, obviously is kind of has a grand title, a grandiose title, but really is about that quest that physicists have had for some time for quote unquote theory of everything that would unite all the forces and really explain fundamentally um, the way our universe works. Um, and obviously they're still on that search. And so I think it's really interesting to follow the history of that from an outsider's perspective. 
And what I love about these books is to realize how so many great thinkers and so much resources and have been sort of put on this. And we're still searching for these really fundamental questions. Uh, we still don't have answers. And so I think to me, kind of knowing where the field is now and what the questions are is just really interesting. Mm, yeah. The next book is a novel and it has been described as creepy and poetic, subversive and strangely funny and a phenomenal piece of literature. And the book is The Seas by Samantha Hunt, which was published in 2004. Why is that on your list? Yes, I think for me, um, I'm always fascinated by how language shapes reality and how language actually can make reality. And this book is amazing in the sense that it actually does take reality and plays with it through the use of language. So she actually becomes in some ways, you know, this, this mermaid that, you know, she actually, their water appears and she's always wanting to go out um, and actually love, for example, so badly that it affects her vision. So she, and she actually means it. So rather than we say a lot of these cliches, sort of like, oh, I'm in love and I can't see well, but she actually does experience these things physically in the course of the novel. So language becomes reality. And so it's very, very fantastical. But on the other hand, it's sort of, to me, showing the real power of language to make things happen, especially in our imaginations. So I think that book is really fascinating. Mm. You say ultimately the book is a poetic look into the nature of consciousness and reality. Yes, yes. Because in some ways, I think, you know, it's very hard to draw a line between what our mind is constructing and what's actually, quote unquote, out there. And I think this book really plays with that distinction and looks at, well, what happens if I use language to say this is the case? What if it becomes the case? Um, and, and I think that not many books are bold enough to do that. Well, I mean, they, it does become the case. If we <laughs> listen to, you know, quantum physicists who say yes. that the energy of language, I mean, we are literally, I mean, isn't this what exactly. prayer and yes. chanting yes. is all about? <laughs> Creating or manifesting, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. The energy of that, the vibration of that spoken yes. word, yeah. Mm. So W.S. Merwin, the essential W.S. Merwin, um, tell me about this book, which is your eighth mm -hmm. book. Yes, um, I find his work just really moving and incredibly inspirational. And I just picked this book because it has selections from his career, because I think to see the arc of his career is really profound as well, just to see his thinking develop. Um, his work to me is so important because it has this quality of really sitting and being in the moment with experience. And I think to really reflect on how sitting allows for memories to wash over us, for hopes and dreams to wash through us, and to be able to express that in actually really simplistic language. So a lot of times his poems don't have a lot of punctuation. They don't have a lot of um, full stops. The lines can be very long at times and other times just very brief. Um, but all the time he's thinking about kind of how does history and the future pass through a single person. Um, and I was lucky enough to hear him read once and just he's such a humble and thoughtful person as well. And I think it comes through in his work. Produced uh, something like 60 plus books. I yes, yes, extremely prolific. Yeah, um, I really liked the um, example that you gave in your write up. You talked about um, uh, a, an aphoristic poem that uh, is about separation. And you said, uh, your absence has gone through me, like thread mm -hmm. through a needle. Everything I do is stitched with its color. I mean, that that's just beautiful phrasing. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, Very I think evocative. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's what's so amazing is that when you find sort of the right simile, the right metaphor, it doesn't take a lot. You know, he doesn't do over explaining, over lecturing. Yeah. You know, it's just so simple and right there. Yeah. And I think he's won so many... Um, literary prizes yeah. um yeah i have to check into him because i was not familiar with him oh yes yes uh, his work is wonderful yeah um lost in math how beauty leads physics astray by sabine hossenfelder that one made me go ooh you know because uh, math and i are not great friends <laughs> <laughs> and sure. um 
I've heard people talk about the beauty, the elegance of mathematics, and I just don't get it. Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, actually, what's really funny about this book in some ways is that it actually talks about how the longing for beauty and the longing for things to be perfect and kind of symmetrical actually does science and math a disservice. So it's actually almost the opposite of people saying, oh, I'm so drawn to the beauty of math or the beauty of science that I'm ignoring facts that I should be seeing or I'm making theories because I want it to be perfect. Or I want to mm. find a symmetrical thing in the universe, but maybe it's not there. Um, and I think that's what's to me really interesting just as an argument sort of philosophically from her book, which is thinking about the fact that just because we want perfection, we want symmetry, we want something to look the way we think it should look, maybe it really doesn't look that way. And so we're kind of pushing our theories in one direction and ignoring the evidence in front of us. Um, so to me, it's even if you're not interested in math, I actually think it's, it can be a really interesting read. So did it shift your perceptions? Yes, it did, because I actually had noticed that myself is that I tend to see, OK, I'd like to have things in a certain way, whether it's in writing or even in thinking, you know, there should be this symmetry, there should be this, uh, you know, so sort of, I've been questioning a longing for for beauty and for what is beauty? Is it symmetry? Is it perfection? Or is it in the irregularity? Um, and I think that that book puts those thoughts. Um, yeah, in my mind, and I think in many readers minds. Mm. The last book on your list is The Places That Scare You, A Guide to Fearlessness in Difficult Times by Pima Chodron. Uh, that was published in 2001. Such a diverse <laughs> list of books. Um, tell me, what was it about this book that earned its place here? Yeah, so she's actually one of my favorite writers. And so I had trouble picking among her books, I would say. Um, but I enjoyed this book the most because I find that especially in challenging times or times when you wonder, you know, how should I go on or what can I do in this really difficult situation? I find her book is really just sort of a breath of fresh air because it does ask you to take a hard look at yourself and to realize that you have more strength than you thought. Um, and that actually just resting and ruminating on the same problems or the same situations isn't actually helpful and is actually not any kind of productive spiritual practice either. Um, and so she really gives these tips and tools, but very grounded in her own experience. So I find that for a spiritual teacher, she's extremely humble and really does use sort of very, very specific experiences, even just cleaning out the bathrooms or doing these things that, you know, you realize, okay, this person is writing as a human being as well. Hmm. Which of these books would you say, um, had the biggest impact on your life path hmm. and your thinking? Yes, I am. Um, I, I think I would say probably Rilke is probably the biggest one, um, not just this book, but all of his work in general. Um, I think that the search for um, to be heard, the so search for people to be heard, the search for oneself to hear other people and to sort of bear witness to other people um, especially children. So to actually have children feel as if someone is with them, someone believes in them, not just in sort of a, you know, platitude way of, oh, I believe in you, but actually who thinks that your ideas and thoughts are worth listening to, um, I think is an actually really profound experience and hard to do. Um, and his work, I think, strives for that. And I really just am in awe of the way he's able to write. Mm. I, I don't know about you, but certainly for me, for a book to stand out for me, it has to have something of the um, sends me into silence mm. for a little while. Mm. There has to be something yeah. there that I have to sit still mm. and contemplate yes, and yes. really think about it. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And that, that to me is the same. I think when I sometimes I read a poem and I just have to sit and stop and think like, wow, Absorb. that is... Yes, yeah. that's incredible. And I think for me, in some ways, that's what poetry allows for us because it's not novel length. It's not, you know, incredibly long. So you can read something in one sitting and then sit with it. So you've written a book. Have you just written the one? Well, actually, I've written a book of poetry or several books of poetry, one full length and a couple of chat books. Um, and then this is my first nonfiction book. And what inspired this one? So I would say probably becoming a mother, um, because before that I had researched language, I was passionate about it, 
but I hadn't actually had experience raising children and thinking about how language plays such a fundamental role in their lives and especially in sort of the stories they tell themselves, which really shape their identities. And so for me to recognize that and then to think how little is being written about that was a cause to write a book about it. So the art of talking uh, with children, what is the most important thing a parent needs to know? Yes, I think um, for me, it is almost a spiritual question, which is just to realize that children are full people at any age. Um, so children have these longings, they have these things they want to say that can be really profound. They have needs and wants that can be really you know, are human and are universal, even if they can't express it. And they have curiosities that are maybe much bigger than they're able to articulate. Um, so I think to really be able to ask yourself, you know, what is this child in front of me curious about right now? What are they really worried about, really concerned about? And getting beyond kind of this developmental lens of just, well, they're a two-year-old, they're going to do that. You know, I think, well, okay, maybe they will, but what actually at this moment is intriguing this child? And I think if we're able to do that a little bit and get into a child's mind, um, you're able to build relationships with them much more profoundly and um, then you're able to communicate better than you could otherwise. How, how old are your children? They're five and ten right now. Okay. Yeah. yeah they, were, they were younger when I wrote the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is important to be able to talk to children in a way that is empowering and supportive and, and to listen to them. I mean, listening is very, very important. Yes, I think, and oftentimes what I've seen in my work is that a lot of times we think we're listening to children, but really we have one agenda and our children have another agenda. So we're having these conversations that are, actually aren't meeting each other where, exactly. <laughs> where we are. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a, a, a phrase in, I think, NLP, which is that, uh, you know, um, I didn't hear what you think you said <laughs> and it, it's so That's often great. true yes. Yes. you know because what I say to you is being heard through your filters and you yes. know the interpretation can be completely yes. different than my intention exactly and I, I do hear that so often with kids saying well my mom doesn't understand me and you know the mother will say well I, I try to understand them you know but but it is a sense of well but what I was trying to communicate didn't really get heard the way I wanted it to be heard so yeah. I do think that's so important. Now, you work uh, um, with all kinds of organizations, including the Wor World Bank. What, what are you doing for them? How does your you know, area of expertise influence what they're doing? Yeah, so I do a variety of things. And for them and other organizations, I do a lot of work on developing curricula. So actually thinking about how do adults learn and how can we support adult learning in ways that actually matches what we need. So a lot of times teaching and learning for adults looks very different um, and doesn't really follow principles that we know adults need to learn. So a lot of times if you go into, you know, professional development for teachers, you have just sort of endless lectures. Um, you know, someone's just expected to sit passively, listen, go home, and then usually forget it the next day. So there's not a lot of discussion of a chance for interactivity, you know, of chance for um, actually people to think critically during this, these sessions. And so a lot of my work um, with them and with other organizations is about how do we transform learning to make it a really interactive and engaging experience for adults. Do you think that we need to transform learning for children? It seems to me that we have so much emphasis on you know, the academic side, the, uh, you know, getting, getting qualifications, yes. passing examinations, that we forget, you know, we forget the beauty of language, we forget the creativity of language, we don't encourage reading as much, except academic reading, you know, reading yes, for yes. what they need to do. Um, and for small children, I think it's, um, you know, it's very challenging. Yes, yes, I, I totally agree with that. And I think probably the most serious thing I see all the time is that we don't think about the role of play and language play um, for all ages. So I see sometimes mm. young children, the resource recess is being taken away, but 
especially for older children. A lot of people don't realize what does it mean to think or learn in playful ways or use language in playful ways and how important it is for children to tell stories, to dream, to think of, you know, hypothetical situations to explore. And we are so focused and kids now I've seen are so focused in response on, you know, did I get all these things right? Or how long does it have to be? You know, these very surface, very just technical considerations. Um, and I think really forgetting the purpose of teaching and learning um, yeah. and communicating. <laughs> so it's, I agree. I think there needs to be a really big rethink. Do you ever get a chance to offer your view to the educational community? Yes, I do, actually. So I do um, professional development work for teachers. And I talk about the themes in my book, but especially as they apply to teaching and learning. So I'm, I'm really excited by that work, because I think um, there's such a big opportunity to bring some of this work into teacher learning. How do you feel about um, social media and the fact that all our kids are learning, you know, all of these abbreviated words, you know, you ask them to spell the word you know, R A R E, and they'll do an R. Yes, and that's it. Yes. <laughs> do you feel that that that's going to be a problem? So I actually probably have maybe a counter counterintuitive approach to that, um, which is that, and it's actually backed by research, which is that kids who are better at doing that kind of texting language are often better spellers in real real academic language as well, and the reason mm -hmm. is because they're able to code switch. So meaning that they're able to know, well, this is how I write in code, sort of in texting language. And then this is how I write in academic language. It doesn't mean they don't need to learn the academic way, but I don't think we have to discourage the other. I really do see it as a form of creativity to be able to play with abbreviations, to be able to you know, say, well, do you know what that means? And here I'm going to make up a new one, you know, and that kind of thing. So I definitely think we need to teach traditional spelling and that's important. But we can also teach that there are multiple ways to communicate and they're appropriate for different contexts, you know, to say, well, in this essay, I don't want you texting abbreviations, <laughs> you know, I want the typical academic things, but also to help kids realize that language is always evolving. You know, language in Shakespeare's time, there was slang. In our time, there's slang. And I don't think I would not go kind of on the side of, you know, let's keep it all standard English or else. I think that creativity in language is, is fun and helpful for kids. It's interesting when you look at the generations and, you know, the, the slang and the buzzwords, mm -hmm. you know, of one generation that mean nothing to the next yes. generation. Everybody exactly. wants yes. to create their own, don't they? Exactly. And that's kind of showing, you know, it, it does bond people because you sort of say, oh, I'm in this in-group because I know this, this slang and my parents don't know it or my grandparents don't know it. So, yeah. 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 Do you think, um, you know, reading uh, is something that... Um, children are doing less of? I do. Yeah, I think a couple of things about that. So I think first, they're doing less reading. And second, they're less motivated to read, because they're often not reading things that particularly interest them. So I think we do, unfortunately, we have a lot of rigid standards about, well, this is the right book for this child at this time. And I met so many teachers who say, oh, I don't want my students reading graphic novels, or I don't want them reading magazines, you know, and I think, well, of course, you don't want them just reading those things. You know, we want them to be exposed to great literature, but why not allow them to pursue their interest in whatever ways, you know, they see literacy. And so for me, I think of it as kind of additive. You can read magazines and you can read graphic novels and you could read Shakespeare. You know, you don't have to pick or choose. Yeah, I remember when my son um, was in, um, you know, what we call junior school, elementary school, I think you call it, and I could not get him to read a book. And uh, I was very concerned about that, especially as I had a great love of reading. And But his teacher said, buy him comics. Yes. He said, mm -hmm. let, him, let him just read comics and he'll mm -hmm. eventually get there. Yes. And, and he did and became yes. a very avid reader. But That's you great. Know, it wouldn't have occurred to me to give him comics. Exactly. But, you know, just, just what, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I mean, everybody was praising J.K. Rowling for getting so many kids <laughs> yeah. back into books. Do you think there's been a decline in reading since then? Or just not enough books like her? Yes. I mean, I do. I do, unfortunately. And I think it does. Social media and, and online gaming and so on, I think, do play a role. I'm not opposed to those things. But I think when they do take away time from um, more in-depth reading, and actually Marion Wolf has 
a great book about this, which is um, thinking about the deep reading brain and finding that it actually can be harder to engage in deep reading if you spend a lot of time you know, scrolling through TikTok or looking at social media posts because you want this immediate feedback. And so it can be a lot harder to get into something um, which is much lengthier. Um, and some actually some solutions I've suggested too is that we expose children a lot more to audiobooks as well um, because I think even without using video or you know or any kind of images because that still allows kids they're not always reading but it allows them to imagine as they're hearing things and I I use that with both of my kids and actually I'm a big audio fan audiobook fan myself um, so me, I think me too yeah yeah <laughs> so what are you reading now oh that's a great question so actually I'm just been reading Lauren Groff's book, The Matrix, or Matrix, um, which is a really big departure from her prior work, but it's about um, medieval women and kind of this abbess that's um, growing up in the world. And um, I find it really poetic and also really fascinating to look at the history and kind of the way the society is working. So I'm reading that. And then I'm also, I'm very interested in art and art history. So I'm reading a book, Matisse the Master, um, which is by Hilary Sperling, which is really interesting and in understanding Matisse's late work as well. Mm. If you had to pick one book from your list to give to somebody uh, that you loved, um, would it be Rilke or would it be something else? Mm. I think it might be Merwin, actually. I think um, it's probably, even if you don't like poetry, I think it's very accessible while being very philosophical. So I think if you think, oh, I don't really enjoy poetry or I don't know what poetry is or anything like that, I think this is the one I would recommend because it feels like it's very grounded in concrete experiences. Um, he actually was, um, for most of his life, was in a sort of raising or tending to a pineapple farm, so in Hawaii. So he has this sort of very, very sensory uh, grounded experience and while being incredibly beautiful in the writing. So that's the one I would recommend. And which of the 10 do you return to the most? Hmm. I think I would say the waves. So sometimes when I'm actually, I, I write fiction and poetry as well. And when I'm just thinking about, well, how do I structure a sentence or what, you know, I feel stuck or sort of my sentences feel dry or kind of boring or bland. I literally just go there. And this, this is a strategy I use a lot actually with different books, but I open the book to a random page and look at a line and write it down and think about what I could use from that line, whether it's a word or just a structure in my own work. And I find that it really does liven my writing, um, obviously without plagiarizing, but yeah. if it's just yeah. sort of a word, a thought, an image, um, I find it can be really energizing. And that book is full of those. Well, there are many, many lines in books that are just sublime and you have exactly. to write them yes. down. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you want to remember them. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for adding your 10 best list of spiritual books to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library of recommendations. It really has been a pleasure to discuss them. Oh, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you. You can learn more about Rebecca Rowland's work and her book, The Art of Talking with Children, which is published by Harper One at her website, Rebecca Rowland, two L's in Rowland.com. And now, as the spiritual book market is becoming increasingly crowded, it's obviously becoming ever more challenging to sort the wheat from the chaff, which is why we launched the No BS Spiritual Book Club to help you uh, find recommendations, uh, trusted recommendations from authors, teachers, speakers, and others who've walked this path before you. So do check out our free 10 Best Spiritual Books archive at the No BS Spiritual Book Club .com. And while you're there, you can also view previous video interviews um, in this series. And you can add your name to our Save My Space list to get last minute uh, reminders of upcoming episodes. And finally, if you have a book in you but don't know how to begin getting it out of your head and into the hands of those who are waiting to read it, click on the Work With Me tab, find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be what you're looking for. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of the 10 Best Interviews for the No BS Spiritual Book Club. And until then, it's goodbye from me and from Rebecca Rowland. Thank you, Rebecca. Bye.
Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.